Hi everyone, uh, here I am Carol Valencia. I used to work as a DevOps. Uh, currently, I am working in Aqua Security and I am focused more in cloud native and all the best practice that we call applied in security. So uh, today I will talk about runtime security with eBPF. We, I will do a introduction. I will. As we can see here in the agenda, I will talk a brief introduction about challenges in container security, the build state and the runtime. Next, I, we will talk about eBPF, what is, what is this technology that is uh, so many uh, so many companies that that, uh, that are investing in in applying this new technology and we will see some runtime security use cases like some attacks on the wild that is happening right now in cloud native let's continue with the first topic that will be talk about container security uh, well here we have the container life cycle as you can see here we have the code the source code that it could be like open source code proprietary code third party and also it could be binaries and libraries plugins and we will take this source code and we will try to build build another uh, library or in the case of containers we will build an image as we can see in the second stage and after that uh, we will uh, have a pipeline a continuous integrations pipeline that it will generate uh, another artifact it could be infrastructure as a code artifacts like terraform cloud formations or even uh, our image container image so if we have a continuous deployment we could automatize this and in the case of our image we will deploy it in some virtual machine or lambda or even a kubernetes um, cluster of kubernetes and we we will have our image in the state of running right? so our container is running right now and in this process that we have especially the pipelines we will have some uh, intermediate steps like for example validate and try to push the image we have this step of container registry when we build this image and if they is uh, build correctly we could push and save this image in the container registry and we use it in the next stage the, we also have if you notice the artifacts that could be the ci artifact and cd artifact that it's another uh, elements that we need to take care of that uh, we will see in the next stage because this is like an overview how we built an image and we will see what about security well here we have the container security life cycle uh, as you can see we have like a new steps for example when we will build we will in the stage of uh, in our continuous integrations pipeline we could apply static analysis tools maybe like the most famous in the past with traditional applications will be SAS, DAS or ACA, the compositions analysis but uh, right now that we are using cloud native applications for example container we also want to do image, image scanning uh, to find the vulnerabilities that we that we have when we build our image that will be also with the dependencies that we have and we could also have another scanning tools that could be like for example for terraform cloud formation that will be the infra code scanning that will help us with the misconfigurations are also with some hard coding data or hard coding secrets that could be found with secret scanning 
then we have like in this stage of the static analysis we could add in our in our inside of uh, our pipeline as a step to do these checkings no? and when we talk also right now we have this new new box that is supply chains because you maybe you heard about uh, about the common attacks that we are already having in supply chains that that means that in this stage of supply chains we will need to protect the source code and also the artifacts that could be uh, as an artifact could be also our CI pipeline or our CD pipeline this is artifact that we need to protect it. for example when we build our source we need to prevent some commit from malicious code uh, if we are talking about to build integrity we need to ensure to sign it metadata in this build process so we could analyze the pipeline to really uh, validate if, if we don't have some uh, misconfigurations or or issue in security and also in the artifact of the deployment we need also to release integrity the supply chains will help us with these check-ins that try to to do some controls to create some standards that help us in this stage but if we see that uh, we have this stage of supply chains static analysis but we also will need some uh, tools or steps in our runtime stage that will be the runtime protection maybe you already hear some tools like rasp or waf that uh, they are protecting at the runtime but they are very specific in some use cases but for example if we are talking about some the container and we have some attack that is happening at the runtime we need other tools that help us to identify for example some process and the linux or the kernel that is uh, happening a bad behavior or suspicious behavior and we need some tool or we need some protections that uh, prevent even prevent not only detect uh, the attack so we will see because the, the talk it's happening it's the talk that i will explain it's more about runtime and the and ebpf and it's in the latest stage this means that means that uh, we need it's good that you have these uh, steps in the static analysis that you use sas does that you use vulnerabilities tools that also it's good and it's necessary that you use some tools for supply chains that you are signing you are creating is bone you are uh, validated your pipelines these are good practice that we need it but we also we need tools protection at the runtime because it's in another stage that we will need so together it will be like a more protection from the source until to the runtime okay so let's continue well uh, as you can see you now we see it in the before slide we always will have new vulnerabilities that is now as a zero date so it's always will be find it also a new misconfigurations that could be in our cluster or in any technology that we are using that we will be find that it's some misconfigurations it could be a hole in security critical vulnerabilities also it's fine uh, continuously it's updating the database with vulnerabilities so that's the reasons that we need some tool for runtime because even if we do the best practice in the supply chains or in the pipeline the depthsecops the shift left we always we are finding some new things at the runtime because our applications is already running and we need in this stage some protections that help us to mitigate the future alerts the future attacks that could happen that always is continually uh, discovering new threats let's continue with the introduction to ebpf 
Here we have a phrase from Brendan Greer. He wrote a lot of material about EBPF. He already has two books that if you want to know more, you can consult. And as you can see here, uh, EBPF is more than 10 years inside of the kernel, of the Linux kernel. So it's already inside of, uh, of our applica applications, Linux application that is using Linux. Um, what problem does EBPF, EBPF try to solve and how it's working? We will, I will try to uh, describe this and how can help us with security, observability, etc. Well, if we want to understand EBPF, we need to understand more deeper the Linux kernel. As you can see here, uh, the main two parts, especially to do some difference in how is working our process, is the kernel space and the user space. The user space is everything that we are interacting, like we have some visual visual code that is here. Uh, we are using maybe Docker that is a client, but we are using from the user space, Kubernetes, another client, or even when we are trying to create a program, like as we can see here, we have a Golang and we will create some binary. We build it and create some program with Golang or Python or Java, but we are in the user space. Uh, these applications could interact with the kernel space. For example, if we create some program that they call some, they need to call some devices, some device drivers, or keep some memory, use the memory, the CPU, we will interact with the system calls. So the system calls is like an interface, as you can see, is in the top of communications né? it's like a, uh, it's in the middle help us like a bridge between the user space and the kernel space so here is the importance of assistance calls we can think about like as an interface and in the kernel space we can imagine all the main modules all the kernel core that could be like uh, i put some functionalities that it's interesting from the point of view of eBPF, like uh, U-probes or key probes or tracy points, that it's uh, functions from the kernel that help us, for example, U-probes interact with the user space and the key interact with the kernel function, the kernel functions, and the trace point with some uh, system calls that is interacting. And uh, we have also some, well, the kernel core is very big, <laughs> but uh, I put some interesting parts that will help us with some topics that I will talk in the next slides. For example, the Linux security module. Maybe you already heard about uh, AppArmor or SecCom, and these are security modules that uh, help us like uh, creating some lists, like some access controls to, to create some uh, white listing that help us with security. For example, try to block some specific syscall, try to, to block or uh, some special uh, system call that interact with uh, some device. So they will try to create some rules, they help us with security. And we also have these uh, load ball kernel modules. That it's another way that we could extend the kernel core functional function functions functions. I'm sorry. And with these load ball kernel modules, uh, we could like try to load dynamically some codes that uh, this uh, cool extent is generally using with device that, uh, for example, you have some hardware or some device driver. And in this, in this common case is when you use this LKM. Okay, so I 
this is like an overview that you try to uh, think about when you try to understand eBPF. You have some kernel fun functions in this kernel space and we have the user space. This is, and we have the system calls like as interface between uh, between both the space and with that we uh, i will put some samples about that will be more clear about uh, how is a system called okay for example here uh, you can use the s trace command that give you a resume about how many system calls you need for any activity that you uh, you are using for example i am putting cat cats and text and to do this action about cat uh, as you can see we have like almost 100 system calls that it means like open try to open the file uh, close write and we have like many system calls that it has to call so, when we are using this uh, our for example these presentations or are using any program soon we are interacting so many uh, with throw many system calls with the kernel so this is like a sample that only can give us an overview that a simple call can call many system calls so as you can imagine the event that is happening at the kernel is thousands of thousands and by seconds. It's so many activity or events that is happening processing. And this is the kind of information that eBPF is uh, receiving. It's trying to tracking and yeah, it's like uh, a lot of events that uh, it's at the kernel level. Okay, so here uh, we can, we have a program, I imagine it's the, the sample that I did before, that you have a program that is calling some system calls. Uh, as you can see, this is happening in the user space, but our program can communicate with the kernel using uh, the system calls. So you can call indirectly like when you the binary it's doing uh, it's not maybe directed like you can he, you can see here that it i am calling some uh, some system calls but uh, for example if we are open a file behind these actions we are calling many system calls like we see in the before slide in this case i am directly calling using this unix point to call yeah you can it can happen in, in many ways that you can interact with the linux kernel well let's continue here we have a, a, di a diagram about the linux kernel architecture and we will see that the application is in the user space and in the kernel space we have the several modules that is specialized in some parts like for example a usb networking we will have like several modules that is specialized in some topics that will interact with the hardware mainly the device drivers and depends of the the CPU, the characteristics of the architecture of our machine, no? we will need some special core functions, kernel functions to interact with this hardware. And in this context, that this is the diagram about the Linux kernel, we will try to think about how is, uh, how is creating a container. What happens when we create a container in Docker RAM? Basically, when we run the Docker run, the Docker uh, is in the user space because it's a client that we are interacting from our shell. And when we create uh, the Docker, these all other container runtimes, they will use the system calls to uh, interact with some kernel components like 
the namespace and control groups né? and try to isol isolate this this process because we will run like a few processes inside of our containers that it will be isolated because of the namespace and control groups that is belong from the kernel from from the and in that way uh, if we can think about at the end the the containers is like a more process that is running in the kernel in the linux kernel and we can explore and try to see these events with ebpf so that it will be well let's try to understand how is working uh, ebpf program in the before slide we see an overview about all the main parts about the kernel core but right now we will try to understand the ppf so as you can see here we have like a complete new section that we can uh, start to think about the user and the kernel space and in the user space as unusual we will have some section for BPF that we could create a program, try to interact maybe with some, try to create some eBPF code né, using C++ or maybe GoLang, throw some wrapper. But uh, just for simple, uh, at the beginning, like, we are using some programs. When we use some programs, we are in the user space. But the difference, the main difference, uh, when you think about it in a simple way, uh, at the beginning, we have some program that we create, some binary that is in the user space. The difference that when we create some program with BPF, this program lives in the kernel space. As you can see, we have some eBPF program, but it's living in the kernel space. And Living in the kernel space is like uh, it, he is receiving all the BPF events. You can think about like an event driven in the kernel space. So eBPF is like receiving all the events that we see in the before slides, they interact with the systems calls that is happening with all the programs. But we have some eBPF program that is living in the kernel space uh, getting these events and we could create some programs that is that could be specialized like in networking observability and security when you create some ebpf program you will have like these steps that is are in this section that you can see that we will have before start to living as a program in the kernel space they will go for an eBPF verifier that will do some shakings. And after that, we'll compile with the uh, with this kernel that you can see is just in time and the kernel. <coughs> and after after compile, we will have an eBPF program in the in native code, in machine code, that after uh, after compile, after uh, go for these steps, after approve it, uh, it will be a, a eBPF program that it's ready to receive this event and work with eBPF map. That it's like you can think about like a key value that will start uh, some important parts to interact with the old the system calls and we have this bpf help caller that uh, will help us to to translate uh, uh, these calls that is happening at the kernel but it will uh, as an input with the ebpf programs so uh, well uh, i think i tried to do in a simple way <laughs> this uh, uh, definition i hope uh, you understand but if you have some any doubts please if it's not clear maybe also with these designs uh, please contact me I, I would love to receive your feedbacks well uh, here in this slide we have like a time life of the features that was added to the Linux kernel 
And many of these features that is in the tracing part, it's that uh, the, some of the main components that we you will see in the PPF programs, for example, key proofs, uh, U proofs, trace points, uh, and all these components that is part of the kernel, it's using for the BPF. So, so you can think about that the BPF it's like born like in this year. Um, basically, because we could uh, create some, compile some program in the kernel space, they can uh, use all the other, the before features that it's, that it's already belong to the kernel, to the Linux kernel. Well, uh, here you can see some basic sample about some BPF program interacting with the networking. Because at the beginning, BPF, it, it was like uh, the next step for the TCP dump. So, uh, the first use cases, it was focused on networking. Uh, as you can see here, now we are in the user space. And here in the kernel space, the BPF program is uh, is reading the system calls about the networking and trying to do some sniffer. Okay, so uh, at the beginning, BPF was uh, focused more in networking, but with uh, other features that uh, eBPF maps and also uh, other features as CDFP, uh, it uh, it will be more uh, complete that could interact with also with the Linux security modules and the others and the other parts of the Linux kernel. Okay, so for example, here in the next slide, well, uh, here in this slide we can see uh, use case for eBPF. Well, we will have in the kernel space our eBPF program after. Uh, is doing the verifier and just in, in, in time compiler with this BPF program could use the the kernel functions the kernel modules like sockets key proofs you proofs that is belong to already to the to the kernel it's part or like uh, some functions that is belong for the kernel they will interact with this kernel functions interact with the BPF program and with that, this BPF program could help us in container security, observability, uh, interaction detection, because we are in the kernel level and we have information about everything about the, all the system calls. We only need to create a program and start to interact with the specific system calls that depends on the use case that we want to resolve, for example, container security, maybe it will be very important to try to track in the names and space and C groups and other actions like privilege, uh, also in networking. So depends on that, what you are interested, you will, uh, you will try to, to hook né, this uh, this important part from the kernel, from the main parts of the the modules that, that the kernel is interacting, for example, networking or user space or kernel space. Okay, so uh, I think with this overview about eBPF, we will try to describe some security attacks in the... Tom, uh, we will hear some uh, eBPF use cases with security. Well, uh, talking about Kubernetes security and with eBPF, because we have access to the all system calls and all the kernel events through BPF programs, we could detect or even better prevent uh, several common attacks that is happening in, Kuber in Kubernetes. Like, for example, some exploitations for credential access, uh, someone has access to the service account and uh, with this they could 
uh, do uh, lateral movements, for example, and try to steer information yeah, because they have already the credentials and they could uh, try to uh, to go to the host, for example, some lateral movement, and or even if we have some privileged container, someone will be, maybe try to do some mounts or some actions, and these actions could be detected with BPF, some container escape, because we can see everything that is happening. It's a is a system call, it's a kernel event. And because BPF is reading, detecting these events, uh, we could create some programs focus on security. So this is like a, a use case in Kubernetes. We will see other. Um, here we have another use case that uh, in security, we maybe you will heard about rootkits that uh, uh, this kind of attack, né, as this meaning of this word, the root, it's some ones that has some uh, privilege, uh, privilege administrator that can, with this privilege, can do some actions in the levels of our operation system or user space or current space. Né, in if we think about in all the levels of privilege that we could. Uh, get access. Uh, well, uh, here we maybe we will have more clear about the levels of the rootkits or the kind, the types of the rootkits, because it will depend of uh, in which part this rootkit is created to reinstalled. And we have several hierarchical protections, né? maybe the protection rings, rings that is very popular né, that you can define how you can get access to the privilege. But uh, in a simple way, you can see that if a rootkit, some program that will have some access to our system could, could be installed in the user space or maybe using some programs in the bootloader or using some resource in the own memory or using the own modules of the kernel. Né, so we have some extensions modules that like uh, the Linux security module or the load wall kernel that they could use also this resource to uh, to create some rootkits and also they own the eBPF technology could be used to create some rootkits because at the end any technology also could uh, could use it for the for the adversary Okay, in the next, we will see some protections. How can you detect the rootkits with eBPF? Well, here uh, you can see that eBPF could help you to hand a rootkit. For example, if someone hook a syscall table, an adversary gains control uh, on the in, in some specific system function, uh, it could be like a uh, reading a file or writing some file, file system and after that the adversary may also hijack uh, the execution flow of, of other process and the system called hooking is, is considered a malicious behavior so with eBPF you could identify this kind of behaviors and it generally is using is used by rootkits so, uh, because eBPF has these BPF events you can recognize this kind of behavior uh, generally in cloud native environments uh, attackers usually execute rootkits on the host if you want to know more about how it's happening, this I am leaving these links that is with more detail how it's happening the attack. Okay. Okay, I will change here. Uh, and here, uh, you can see that also some root kits that already happening, it's using uh, some 
open source that people is trying uh, trying to learn or is from security that it's like testing some feature or uh, maybe you are trying to learn some technology and you build your project and the adversaries attackers use these friendly projects that is not with the uh, hacking purpose and they use these repositories that they have for example here is uh, uh, a research about rootkit and that it's used in some real attacks né? this is like a uh, this common thing that you see some repositories in github that someone is trying to learn that it's published and this is reusing for uh, attacks purpose né? okay so this is a sample for example this is a you can find it né? it's a project that is a trying to uh, explaining how to create a rootkit with load ball kernel modules and it was used in real attacks okay then i will change here here we have another attack that is happening in runtime uh, the file is attack that it's creating some descriptor it's running the, the program the malicious program at memory with this if it's running at memory uh, some of the tools like uh, AVs, uh, antivirus, or uh, even network tools like endpoints. Uh, maybe it's common that not detect these kind of behaviors because they only uh, detect based on file system. If because in files you are creating load in the program at memory, you can detect or use these traditionals. Uh, security tools so it's a, a difficult attack to detect uh, you have here some uh, explanations how uh, how can you detect using linux for example maybe could use using ld preload or using the own system calls of linux like main fd create or ptrace and uh, with that they they can they can have the the creation of this this process at memory okay. uh, here as you can uh, i put this example that how easily you can create the with the own linux features for example main fd create that it was in the before slide you can only uh, calling in any program and in that way you create an anonymous descriptor and you set this to run it to, to run in a fileless mode okay if you want to be more detailed how to execute it i, I give you the details at the in the slide here uh, you have a demo né, about that i am executing date that but i am executed in the fileless mode i am using this program run it and uh, as you can see with using tracy uh, i am detected this suspicious behavior yeah. all the details are to you can do it in your at your home uh, you can try it it's, it's not a malware it's a benignous process so you can try it at your your house uh, yeah and the uh, here we have that uh, using the, the explanations that in the before slide main fd create syscall it's happening real attacks as you can see that here is described that using main fd called even the same program that i use main run but today was used in real attacks uh, more details you will have about uh, in this blog and it was using a Shuri that basically use uh, encryptations uh, to to be more uh, difficult to detect and uh, with that they 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 use with a malware né? in the before in the before demo i use only running a date né? a benignous process like it's been dated 
but uh, in that case you can execute any other program in that like a malicious program that could be a malware okay well uh, that is the end thank you so much this is the tool that i was showing here in the sample well thank you so much for being here uh, any doubt that you you have it uh, here you can contact me in linkedin github i will happy to talk more about this content uh, bye